purpose of a memorial service is threefold. <coughs> Number one, uh, the purpose is to honor the life of the deceased. And uh, that's uh, Tracy. Uh, and uh, of course, we, we, were, we were blessed to be able to have Tracy a part of our church family and get to know her as long as we have. The second reason is to give comfort to, and hope to the family and friends of those that are left behind. And the third purpose for a memorial service is to, to look into our own heart and to make sure that each of us are ready, if this would have been our day, that we're ready to meet the Lord. So that's basically three reasons for a memorial service. And uh, so at this time, I have asked Herb Jones uh, to, uh, well, why don't we do this? Go ahead and uh, take your songbook that's in the front and turn to page 56. Page 56 in your songbook. When we all get to heaven, Amen. we're going to sing the first, second, and the fourth. July 10th, 
kind and gracious Heavenly Father. Father, we come to you with heavy hearts today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have known Tracy as our sister in Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we know, Lord, that she is in a place where there's no suffering tears. And thank you, Lord, to have known Tracy and her family. We ask you now, Lord, to be with her husband and her daughter. Ask you, Lord, to give them comfort and to give the rest of her family comfort. And we ask you all these things, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Brother Jones said it was an honor to be able to have known Tracy. Tracy was a sweetheart. I can't tell you how when she first uh, wanted to come and get in the choir, we had the kind of culture. But uh, as uh, Rachel got in there, she wanted to get up here, and she actually did a very good job at it. She said, Preacher, she says, if I can't stand, would that be all right? I said, Tracy, you just come right on. If you've got to sit down, you go right ahead. But she did have a heart for it. She did have a heart to... Uh, to be faithful to church. She was very faithful to coming to church, very faithful to the Lord. She always gave a testimony about the Lord. And she's always excited about when she'd go out with her husband and daughter there to be able to pass out the gospel tracts. And I tell you, that's very rare today to have a whole family that uh, where everybody is willing to get out there and sacrifice for the cause of Christ. And uh, boy, they're a wonderful example of that. And we just want to let you know, dear brother and sister, that we love you so much and, yeah. and uh, we care for you. And it's obvious that your friends care for you the way they have come and given their time to show their love to you and your family. Uh, Rachel, or, or, uh, Tracy, what I'd do, I'd cut it. She, she always had a smile on her face no matter where I was at. She'd be in the hospital and she'd be smiling up at me. And I'm thinking, she's encouraging me and I'm supposed to be here encouraging her. But uh, she always had a smile on her face there, and uh, that's something that I, as her pastor, will always remember. And my wife, as we would visit with them regularly, uh, she had a real sweet spirit about it. She, uh, she understood uh, where she was going to go. She didn't want to be in pain. And she knew where she was going. And folks, I can say this without hesitation. Uh, I've did a number of funerals over the years, memorial services, and there is a big difference between a saved person and an unsaved person at a memorial service. Big difference. So we're here today rejoicing over the fact that uh, we know there's a loss that's taken place and that can't be replaced on this side of eternity. But we do know that she, where she is, she's in a place of, as uh, my dear brother said, peace and a place of no pain or suffering. At this time, Johnny, where are you? If you'll stand, I've asked anybody that would like to just share a testimony or something uh, about Tracy, maybe a memory that you had, uh, if you will just uh, raise your hand as he gets done with each one. And we want to give everybody an opportunity that wants to speak. Hi, I'm Shirley Saxon. 
and I met Tracy last March. She was my first friend when I moved to this area. And she had on her Jesus Saves t-shirt. She was always such a good, good role model. Her whole family was. Sweet people. The last time I saw her, she said she she wasn't looking well. She said she wasn't feeling well at all. It was her last day at the flea market. And she gave me a big hug. And she says, I love you, Mama. And I loved her. Thank you. I know that's hard. Thank you so much. Yes, Brother Stoffy. I don't know if I need this. <laughs> I met Tracy in 1984-85 in school. I asked her, Tracy, I said, you remember what I was like? She said, you were a punk. I was unsafe. I had asked her out, and she says, I, I don't remember that. But I said, I did. And we went our separate ways. And I was planning on moving to Florida with a ministry, and she saw it on Facebook, and she typed, uh, want me watch it. She thought the kids were younger. She said, you want me to come and watch the kids for you while you back up? Back there, like, who is this woman? Leave me alone. She scared me. So a couple, of, a couple of, about a week later, she's on Facebook. She's all upset. She's got problems. She's got troubles. I went back and said, well, let's meet somewhere, and I'll comfort you. And it was Dunkin' Donuts and Route 12 for those in Connecticut, and Gales Ferry. And we were there five, six hours just talking. And I'm hugging her because she's, she was going to commit suicide. And a little bit afterwards, she showed me the, the wine cooler she gave me. And we're at the river. And this time in Connecticut, the rivers are mighty because all the snow is melting. And I took that wine cooler and I threw it in the river. I thought it was going to float over the waterfalls. That thing sunk. And we, we just laughed. But I've been praying for a wife during that time. And I met Tracy. I'm going home on Boswell Avenue. And the Lord said, that's her. That's the one I got for you. So I contacted Tracy the next day. I said, Tracy, you're marrying me. <laughs> but first, let me tell you something. I'm no ordinary Christian. Now, she, she's been saved. She had no idea what Christianity was. I said, you're coming out on the street with us, and you're going to see what we do as a family. You're going to take. And when she came out the street holding signs, giving gospel, she came right into the family right away. My children were calling her Miss Tracy and just taking her as, as, as a mother in the family. And she was remarkable. I was her preacher teacher. When I went over there, I, I talked to her dad. I said, I, said, I, said, I, I want to marry your daughter. I want, to take him to, I want to take her to Florida. She got on the phone and called the pastor and, said, and had the pastor tell her father that, listen, I'm going down, which all didn't come to be. He's going to be an evangelist. He's going to be a teacher in the institute. And this is all the plans. And the father said, take her. I trust you. So Tracy knew, Tracy has been sick her whole entire life. She had double breast cancer in 1985. When I met her, she was just going off the drainage. And I'm not passing notes about her previous life and all that. And she said, will you come to the doctors with me? I had to. I, want, I wanted to, I'd love to, but I had to for her. Pastor knows. Now, the same doctor is the same doctor for my first wife. And this is a wonderful testimony that got us together. I went in with her, went in the room. Doctor opens up the door. What's going on here? This is my preacher, this is my teacher, and we're going to get married, we're going to Florida, we're going to have the ministry. And that doctor looked at her and said, that's, that's the man you want. He's going to be with you. He's going to stand by you. I approve of this marriage you guys are going to get. And good news, you're cancer free. So she took the name Haver and she found out that there is a place in Connecticut called Haver, Connecticut. That's where she wanted to get married. So we got married in a little place, a green, because I taught her, I taught her Baptist history. And Greens up in Connecticut and in New England is where they preached. Street preaching. That's what I did. So we, she wanted to get married to Hayward Green and she wanted me to preach at her wedding and I did. 
And she took off into it. And you see her shirt there and her pictures. There's that, that bright red t-shirt. She met people at Walmart. She took, people at Save a Lot would say, how's your wife doing? She's like, well, what about me? <laughs> and at churches, she had gospel tracks. She, the, the chick tracks and the little cars. That, that flame. She'd give them to all the children. All the children would come run up to her. Miss Tracy, give me a track. Give me one of those tracks. People at the hospital, doctors. I'm not even faithful enough to witness to my doctor. She's witness to her doctor. She's witness to the nurse. She had on her tray table a stack of tracks. And they would tell her, no, we got that one. You got another one. And she, she's in glory tonight without pain. I don't know what finally happened to her. The last week of her life, she went totally downhill. Not me, but the Lord... She's in glory with crowns, inheritance, and jewels, and gold and silver because she came to me. And I thank the Lord for knowing her because I, I, I've got a, two tremendous holes in my heart. And like Pastor said, I like to think it, she was there in the ministry. And each year, the, we go to the 500 and we pass out gospel tracts, and I preach. She loved it. But each year, the first year she, she stood. The next year she had a walker. And every year she's got worse and worse. And when we moved down to Florida in 2011, she got MRSA. And I took her over to the hospital in, in Port Orange and she died in the emergency room. She died. That's what the doctors told me. They resuscitated her. She's been on two... Ventilators. Her life down here. And she kept serving the Lord. She'd come out, she'd get back serving the Lord as much as she could. The all, the all flea market, she had the trick tracks. I would sit back with Rachel and, and Tracy. They were, I didn't have to do nothing. <coughs> Woman called me, I want to know about this thing. Man, she had the trick tracks. She spin that thing around and she knew. And she's always amazed when I say, You inspired me for a message. You inspired me such me. And as a family, I teach my family every night the Bible, except for church nights. We went all the way from Genesis to Revelation. We went back to Genesis. The last Bible study we had were in the book of Job. Elihu has finished his discourse. I was going to teach that night when she was at the hospice. Our friends from church came. We sang. I was going to teach to her. And it got late. And I said, Lord, we're going to have, our, we're going to have a Bible study there. She doesn't have much time. She didn't. She, she died 3.30 the next morning. And when you look at, and I forget what chapter of Job it is, but when you look at Elihu's last discourse, the next chapter says, And Jehovah spoke to Job. God spoke to Tracy in, in a Bible study I couldn't do. It's enough. Your family's visited you. Your husband's told you to go. Go home. And I have some people yell at me because they don't understand Christ. I'm happy she's gone. <clears throat> because if this was church tomorrow, she'd come here, she'd be pastor. No, she'd be sleeping. She'd be sore, unable to walk. Man, she's hop, skipping, and jumping right now. She has no pain. No more hospital, no more doctor visit, no more pills. That's the blessed hope. And they say envy is a sin, but when you envy a loved one that has gone off, this is my second time, when you envy a lost, lost one that's gone home, you want to go. So it, there is no trouble with her going. How wonderful is Tracy? The big hole that's left in my heart. And he, every one of you got something with Tracy. See that smile? That picture there is our honeymoon night. Behind that smile and those teeth, that smile only happened after we met. You asked Rachel. Behind that smile uh, is a woman who was in a lot of pain. Her body told her when her medicine was going to wear up. Now, it would have been selfish for me to keep asking the Lord. But that night when Mark and our church family came, Rachel had left the room for something. I, I bent down to her. Oh, my God. I said, Tracy, go home. Go. She 
said, I'm waiting for you. The last word she said to me, she said, she told me earlier, I love you. The last word she really said, it wasn't to me. She thought she was drowning in a bed or something. The last word she said was, Styley, let me up. He said, what kind of words are those? She knew who I was and she knew who could help her. And the Lord took her home at 3.30. Been a great blessing to me. Still a great blessing. Thank you, Brother Stein. No, that was hard. I've known him for quite a while here. He's, he's always been a soul winner. Yeah. yeah. I loved his family. Grace would be out of the streets. But you passed here for many, many years in jail. We were both in jail together, the same charge. Gosh, got trapped. We always say we got a little more information goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. We, yeah, we've had some good time many together many. with your pastor here. He's been a good man. We love him. And it seems like all these jails now, they're so, they don't want to use the King James Bible. And I want you to talk to a Jew about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Who are you going to talk to? Huh? How are you going to get that person saved? Huh? But I thank the Lord that through my memories, well, I've met many people that have really loved the Lord. I remember old Stiley when we came to church here. I was I was a greeter there. Yeah. And I'd hugged him. We love each other. We had great times to go down the street. With her. And I thank the Lord that she's right where she is, because that's where I want to be. Amen. <laughs> and I'm longing for that day. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you. Anyone else? You just have to lift your hand. Yes. <clears throat> this is for the couple. The man and woman of God that I met at the flea market. Many times I went there and they gave me the tracks. And I learned a lot. But I remember one time I didn't go there for three, about six weeks. And when I showed up, they were so concerned. Where have I been? So their ministry extended beyond evangelism. They have a heart for God, both of them, along with this beautiful Rachel. And they had been praying for me. And of course, I must say, your prayers were answered. <laughs> I really appreciate your ministry. And uh, you three, I love all three of you. And uh, Stanley, you will be more on fire for Jesus and you've ever been, I believe that, Lord. And I think I'm so thankful that you have Rachel in, in your life and the ministry that's coming forward uh, as a, an evangelist as you move forward uh, sharing this story with me. That was, uh, oh, what a testimony. Thank you for your testimony, Scott. Thank you, Clay. Yes. Thank you, Brother Stein. Tyler and Tracy and Rachel in Daytona Beach. They were attending some church I'd never heard of. I think I've never heard of it still. But uh, we and they were out for the same purpose, and that was to tell people about Jesus. And we had the, the privilege of knowing Stiley and Tracy and Rachel. They were a blessing and a help. And then whenever my wife told me that Tracy was in hospice, we and Chris and Nicole all went to see Tracy and Stiley and Rachel that night. That was a Tuesday night. Well, wherever we go, 
we can be a blessing to somebody, we try to sing that blessing to them. I wasn't sure if I was going to tell you this, but I will. Lori and I, Chris and Nicole, tried to sing just as I am. And Tracy was there. She was not feeling well. And she wasn't doing well. And she didn't seem to be lucid. But she heard those words and she heard that tune and she became restless in bed to the point we had to just, we, told, we thought we better stop before we got in trouble. And so we spent a little time with, with Tracy and, and Stiley and Rachel and Peanut. <laughs> and as it was time to go, we were able to sit for just a moment sing just the first verse of Jesus Loves Me yes. and let Rachel know that whatever she was going to do next, the right answer was to do it for Jesus. And if she needed to go, of course she needed to go. And if she was going to stay, that was good too. But the next minute needed to belong to Jesus. And she seemed not agitated to have comfort. And so this is how a few of us were able to spend some of Tracy's last hours with her. And it's a blessing to know that in the last hours of your life, being with, with the people that Jesus puts in your life can be a comfort. Yes. And uh, that memory, of course, will be with us for a long time. Thank you for the opportunity. Tracy, and thank you all for taking good care of this family. Thank you. Anyone else? When I was getting ready the photo album, many of them I don't remember, but her smile. <laughs> Just what she's been through, I, it brought back memories of what my real mother went through. When the nurse told us that we might not have enough time, the Bogarts and the Conway wanted to come Thursday, something told me to text them now. And then when they were with us, the nurse allowed us to put our dog with mom and They say that dogs know what's gonna happen. She knew. I won't ever forget that night how, as we were trying to sing Just As I Am, she was reaching up. And I was talking to my uh, Granny Aunt Debbie and we were talking like how Stephen saw Jesus standing. I kept on thinking, she was probably getting ready. She was both climbing to get to Jesus. And remembering as I saw her dead, I stood on the same side that where I stood when my mother died. And I remember stepping away from my dad to hug her and kiss her that final time. That's when she died. And I'm looking at my stepmom dead. I'm like, why? I'm not blaming God. I'm just saying, why? If it weren't for my stepmom, I wouldn't be here. I would probably not be a woman. I didn't know how to cook then. I'm happy she taught me how to cook. I'm happy she did all that for me. I'm helping my dad and I'm like, 
if she did die back then in the emergency room, they weren't able to bring her back. I don't know what I would have done. And I remember the marriage, that rainy day, how she still had that beautiful smile. I tried all my life to remember that smile and Pastor knows about that morning when I'm on the computer, I'm doing some work. Next thing I know, I see her coming out of the bedroom. I got scared. It was that morning, I, was, I told pastors, that, and I told my dad, it's like I'm getting these visions that she's there, and she's not. It's like I'm expecting her <coughs> to be there, coming out of the bedroom, and she's not there. I'm outside doing a couple of things. I see her sitting on her chair. I'm seeing her do her lawn work. I'm like, at night, I get up, just get myself a drink of water and use the bath. I always look over to see if she's in her chair. And she's not there. And I know she's in heaven, but you always look. Just, it's that love. And. I've had eight years with my blood mom and I had, biological mom, I had only nine years with my stepmom. And I thank God she, she was brought that way with my father to teach me. Even though she had pain, she was able to teach me everything that I needed to know. Thank you, Rachel. Anyone else? Weeping is, is natural during this time. And I'm so thankful that, that we have an example in the Bible of someone who wept. The Bible tells us that Jesus had a very close friend, Lazarus. And the Bible tells us that as he was there, that he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But he also seen the hurt of all those around him. And the grief and the sorrow that from that great loss of a man who was greatly loved. And the Bible tells us, and Jesus wept. So it's all right to weep. The Bible tells us there's a time for weeping, and there's a time for rejoicing, and a time for life, a time for death. And each one of us, if the Lord doesn't come back, raptures out of here, we're all going to taste of this death. Charles Hayden Spurgeon said, he said that I would not like to be in that group that's raptured out. He said, because I want to taste what my Lord tasted. And that's exactly what Tracy done. She had faith. She went out into eternity. The Bible tells us that we'll see her again. If you have your hymn books, we're going to go ahead and sing one song. In, that's 280. This is one of her songs that she liked, 280 in the hymn book. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. We'll sing all four verses.
at verse 48, Deuteronomy chapter 32. In the Old Testament, there's a beautiful, beautiful phrase that's given regarding those who uh, die in the Lord. And the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 48, And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Baron, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And notice that the Lord is going to say to Moses, And die in the mountain whither thou goest up. And here's the phrase, And be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people. The Bible told us and tells us here how God had spoke to Moses and said that you're going to go up here and you're going to die. You know, I have learned this in my life. We're not going to go till God says we're going to go. God's got a time for every one of us and it's on his calendar. I remember myself many years ago when I went into the hospital and come out and I had resolved to die that night. I'd sat in my bed, and, and uh, I just knew I was going to die that night. And I sat up, and I looked at my beautiful wife and knew that by the morning I wouldn't be there. I had heart trouble when I come out of the hospital surgery. And uh, I somehow I fell asleep that night. But an amazing thing happened. I woke up the next morning. And I realized that day, that I don't get to go till God says it's time for me to go. I heard what an old preacher said one time. He said, God can come and pick a flower any time he likes. And that gave me comfort. When our, uh, my cousin's four-year-old daughter was accidentally ran over by her cousin in the truck. And the old preacher said, God can come pick a flower any time he likes. And in the Old Testament here, he gives this beautiful picture of what happens when we take our last breath. The Bible tells us, I hear this preacher, are we going to be known in heaven? You are going to be known, folks. The Bible tells us that we're going to be gathered under our own. But I want you to also notice in a New Testament passage, found in the book of John chapter 11. So if you'll look there with me for just a moment. John chapter 11. And look with me down at verse 25. Here, again, is the story of the raising of Lazarus. And the Bible says in verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Amen. And then notice her response. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. There was a day when Tracy was confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and she had a decision to make. She had a choice to make. And the day that she made that choice to receive the grace of God, the gift of God, it changed her life completely. It changed her destiny. Uh, the Bible says, it, we're, we're given, we sing a song, we've been given a new name. The Bible tells us that uh, with this comes, the Bible tells us that when one person receives Christ, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Now, there's a, there's a notice and an awareness that takes place when somebody on earth comes to know Christ as their personal Savior. Turn with me to John 14. I want to go to the Lord in prayer before we begin here and ask the Lord's blessing upon the remainder of our service. Father, we 
We come before you today, Lord God. And we're so thankful, number one, that you gave your life for us. And we're so thankful that we have this Bible, Lord God, that tells us of your great love and tells us what awaits us in the life hereafter. And Father, we know that though we cannot see her physically right here and touch her hand, Lord God, just like stepping through a door, she's there with you right now, Father. She is more aware of you than we could ever be aware of you, Father. She is learning things that we have never learned, seeing things that we have never seen, her hearing things that we have not heard. And Lord, just be with the family tonight. Thank you for the testimonies that were given. Thank you for the memories that are being made. And in the days that come forward, Lord God, with this amazing grace, fill this family in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Uh, in this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to encourage, uh, encourage the disciples and encourage the believers. What had happened during this time, many of loved ones had died in the Lord, went and fell asleep. And uh, by this time, the Bible tells us that there were those that were saying, you know, they were the days began to be weeks, weeks began to months, months began to be years. And uh, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus had uh, had, uh, wrote, had spoke this uh, in the Passover chamber. And uh, but notice what he says in John chapter fourteen, verse one. He says, "Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me." In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now Jesus had encouraged those disciples. He encouraged those that were around. We're encouraged today as we read this passage of the Lord Jesus telling us that he has a prepared place for a prepared people. And the Bible tells us that one day this will be our destiny. This will be our place of residence. And the Bible tells us that we can rejoice over that because He lives. We can live. And then that brings us to the passage of 1 Thessalonians. And I'll ask you to turn there with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And by this time the Apostle Paul is the writer. Paul is going to encourage the believers because, again, the believers were wondering, when is my loved ones going to rise? When am I going to see my loved ones? Uh, days and weeks and months and years turned into that, and they had not raised, they had not been united. And the Bible tells us through the Spirit of God, and I love what the psalmist says, Listen to what the psalmist says before we read Thessalonians. Psalm 116, 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Now on our side, it's sorrow as it should be. If we had it our way, no one would ever get to go be with the Lord. We'd be selfish and want to keep them here all the time. I mean, if we had it our way. But the Bible says that when a Christian dies, they just fall asleep in the Lord. It's as if I would walk through that doorway and be in that room over there. You could not see me, but I'm just as alive over there as I am out here. And that's how it is for a believer. The Bible tells us that when a believer dies, takes that last breath, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible tells us that we must put off this corruption. The Bible tells us that, that, uh, that we will 
see him as he is. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians, look at, look at chapter 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul, he uses a word, he says, I would, brother, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brother. And that word ignorant means, I don't want you to be uneducated. God wants you to know where your eternal destiny is going to be. God wants you to know that when you take that last breath, that if you are born again, you will be right there with Him. Now notice what He says in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Notice the beautiful language the writer uses. Uh, as a Christian, when we take our last breath, it's like just falling asleep in the Lord. And then notice what he says, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He, he's saying there that it's not, he, he's not telling you not to sorrow. He said, but there is a sorrow that, we're, that we don't have, and that is uh, that those that the unsaved have. See, we know that when we take our last breath where we're going. So don't sorrow in that aspect like the unsaved sorrow. I can't tell you, folks, listen. I can't tell you how many times by people's deathbed I've asked their loved one, do you know if they were saved or not? And I hear this more than you would believe, expect. I'm not sure. Now to me that's sad. That a person does not even know your own mate enough to know whether they are born again. Well, they're religious. They did go to church. Have that question with your loved one. Get that settled today if you're not settled. Paul says, But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which fall asleep or are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The Bible tells us that there's coming a day. I have loved ones. I've got family members who's with the Lord right now. Many of you do. The Bible tells us there's coming a day when the trumpet's going to sound. And the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. They're going to get a jump start on us. The Bible tells us that that body which was sown in corruption will be incorruptible when it's raised new. The Bible tells us that glorified body will be raised. The Bible tells us that when that trumpet sounds, we're going to change in the twinkling of an eye. And the Bible tells us that we're going to be caught up together with the Lord. That's a beautiful phrase in the Scriptures where he says... Uh, in verse 15, he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, folks, not angels, listen to me, not an angel. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God and with and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That, that, that's all those that were saved before the rapture that has fallen asleep in the Lord. Notice what else he says. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up. That word caught up is a beautiful phrase in the Bible. You will not find the word rapture in the Bible. But this phrase here is where we get our Greek word rapia where we get our word rapture from. So the Bible tells us that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Repeat means a snatching away. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now when the Lord comes the next, the second time, it's going to be in a twofold advent. He's going to come in the clouds the same way He went up in the air. He's coming in soul life manner. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ is going to rise. We that are alive and remain is going to be changed and caught up together to be with them in the air. And we're going to have a what we call a Baptist feast. We're going to have a feast for seven years. And then after that, the Bible tells us that we're coming back. 
And he's coming back, and guess where he's coming? He's heading home. He's heading to Jerusalem. He's heading to sit on his throne, on his seat. The Bible tells us that he's going to make all wrong right. The Bible tells us that we're going to come back with him. And the Bible tells us that we shall reign with him for all of eternity. Now, I want you to understand Paul's final verse here, what he wants you to get out of this. I want you to have the hope that Tracy, that was just her house, just her house, she's got a new house now. She's, she's clothed with the Lord right now. The Bible tells us, and here's what he says, he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, Rachie and Rachel and Stiley, you can comfort each other with them words as the days go by. You have the biblical promise that you will see her again. And I, 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 thought, I thought about this, and I thought, if, if we could bring Tracy back, and if, if I could just talk to Tracy for a minute and say, Tracy, what would you like me to tell your family and your friends? I, I am confident that she would not say this. Well, you tell them all about me. No, I believe what she would say. You tell them about my Savior. You tell them I want to see Him. You tell them to make sure that they know that they know. I believe if we could talk to her right now, She'd say, oh, preacher, you tell them how beautiful it is up here. You tell them about the peace that, that is here. You tell them about the glory of the Lord and the beauty of His holiness. I believe that if we would say, okay, well, you want to trade places? She'd say, not a chance. So the question is this. Do you know Him? know him personally. The Bible tells us, but as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God. The Bible tells us this, these things have I written unto you, he's talking about the scriptures, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants you to he wants you to be educated in it. He wants you to have this, this blessed hope the, as we look for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head, every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one looking around. How many here could say, Preacher, one thing I do know is that I will see her again, not because of who I am, but because of what Jesus done for me. Preacher, I've been born again. I know I'll see her again. If that's you, would you just uplift your hand unashamed? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Would there be anybody here say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that if today was my day and this was my funeral that I would go to be with the Lord. I'm not sure of that, but I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus loves me. And I want you to pray for me, preacher, before it's too late. If that's you here today and you do not know that if this was your memorial service that you would be with the Lord, would you just up raise your hand where I can pray for you? Is there anyone like that? Up raise your hand. Thank you, young man. God sees your hand. Yes, thank you, young man. God sees your hand. Thank you. Many years ago, a preacher said this to me, if you can provide the sinner, God can provide the Savior. And I prayed with the best faith I know how. And I said, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Save my soul. Make me what you'd have me to be. Now I'm going to repeat that in just a moment. If that's how you feel, you say, Preacher, I'm not sure, but I want to settle it today. Would you just pray and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. 
and save my soul. Make me what you'd have me to be. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer, man, would you just uplift your hand? Thank you, young man. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we love you and Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that uh, for the life that you have allowed us to be a part of, Tracy, and the beautiful woman that she was. Lord, we, are all, we all have our trials and struggles and faults, Lord God, but there's one thing that we do have in common, and that is we love you, Jesus, as Tracy loved you. And Lord, I pray that you would especially be with the family and the friends at this time and this hour. And Lord, would you just recall good memories, sweet memories, as the days go forth, Lord. Be with those that have come. Give them safe traveling. Thank you for their time. Thank you, Father, for their love and their commitment to Brother Stiley and Rachel. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. At that time, this will conclude our memorial service.